Good morning and welcome to another episode of Did You Know? MF3P, where we protect, make, and save you money. Our goal is to always educate and inform. Today's discussion is going to be with uh, with our accountant. He's a partner um, or a principal, as he says, at Sweeney and Conrad. Mm -hmm. They've been in business for over 43 years. I personally have been working mm -hmm. with Thomas uh, Jones since 2012, I think it is. Uh, so it's a long-standing relationship. Today's discussion uh, was, I got the idea from Rich Dad, Poor Dad, uh, where they emphasize that it's not as much money you make as well that you're financially astute and how much you're able to keep. That all starts with making sure that you have a professional accountant engaged and uh, consulting with them throughout your journey in real estate. Uh, Thomas, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, thanks, Michael. Um, and, and also, first off, just appreciate you uh, asking me and bringing up this idea. Uh, I uh, love to talk about taxes, I'm kind of a tax nerd. I, death and taxes are inevitable. No one likes to talk about them, but uh, it's something I've spent my whole career and, and educated myself a lot about. Um, so I'm very passionate about it. I have my master's in accounting, uh, CPA. I've been an enrolled agent. Uh, I have worked my way up the ranks through uh, at Sweeney Conrad here. And now I am leading the uh, team that focuses on uh, taxation of operating businesses in our firm. So I've seen a lot of different uh, situations over the years. We get to work with a lot of very cool business owners, a lot of really cool individuals and executives and investors of all walks of life. So I love it when people ask me all sorts of financial questions because uh, there's a few things I haven't seen before and it's fun to talk about. Well, thank you very much, Thomas. Today, we're going to break it up into two sections. The first section is somebody who's actually looking to sell their house and the tax implications that they should uh, take into consideration. The baby boomers, which uh, I am at the tail end of the baby boomers, are all people that are sitting on a lot of wealth, real estate wealth, maybe not as much cash uh, rich, but definitely real estate rich. And uh, for that purpose is, uh, they tend to be staying in their homes longer. But when they do consider selling, one of the first uh, implications are, what are my tax implications? So in general, just to get started, when somebody goes to sell their house, uh, what are the, the tax implications that sh they should take into consideration during this uh, very important time in their life? Yeah, so as a baseline, uh, they'll have a federal capital gains tax and a California tax. But then we start to think about, well, what kinds of exceptions, exclusions, deferrals can we work into the mix as well? So if it's been their primary residence, if they meet those requirements, then they have the ability to exclude up to $250,000 or $500,000 worth of uh, capital gain. So most people are pretty familiar with those rules. If it's a property that you have thought about moving out of and renting for a period of time and Maybe it's already a rental and you want to sell that property. Maybe it's eligible to do a 1031 exchange, a like kind exchange where you get a new property and you defer that recognition of gain into the future. But uh, ultimately, you really want to start thinking about this early because there could be potential liquidity issues. A lot of times this is a really significant asset for people. So how is that going to affect your retirement? Are you going <clears> to <throat> depend on some of that equity to fund your retirement? You want to be asking these questions and doing some of this planning before you get that uh, offer in hand. Most of our owners have owned their home for many, many years. And one of the big questions that I'm always asked is the repairs that I've uh, taken care of over the years, are they tax deductible? Yeah, uh, and so they are. We would, in as in a... a in tax law, we'd call it, your, it's part of your basis. Uh, so we don't deduct it on Schedule A as an itemized deduction, but we'd be taking it as a basis to reduce your gain in the property. So things like uh, repairs, improvements, those are things that as you own your home, you definitely want to document. And as we work with clients, it's not uncommon that they haven't maybe done the best job of documenting things. And, and I would highly recommend at least trying to come up with a mental list. Okay, I repaired the roof. It was probably that many years ago. 
Uh, we replaced the electrical, we painted the house, we redid the kitchen. And then from there, figure out, can I reach out to some of those contractors? Can I find copies of receipts? Can I find some kind of estimated cost? Maybe there's some other bank records or something where I can at least get a ballpark amount uh, for what that was, because those can be some of your biggest tax savings when you're selling your home. Uh, if you've owned your house for 30 plus years, there's more than likely you've probably put a significant amount of repairs and, and um, improvements into your house just to keep it updated and looking good. Well, with the um, with the type of recovering of the expenses that you're discussing, when I, I know that I download at the end of each year my credit card statements and my bank statements. Typically, is that adequate, for example, Home Depot repairs and, and that type of thing for putting together as far as reduction of my tax base? Usually... The IRS would want to see the actual receipts and and that's because they're trying to prove two things. One, did you actually incur that cost? And two, was that cost actually for the intended what you said it was for? Um, for example, did you go to Home Depot and buy materials for the roof or did you go to Home Depot and, I don't know, buy tools and the tools aren't being sold as part of the home? So that's one reason why the IRS would want to have as much detail as possible. That said, there's been some audit situations where uh, we can say, best thing we've got is the copy of this bank statement or this credit card record. You have to just trust us. This is what it's for. And it's up to the auditor to use their discretion. But I, I find that most auditors would be pretty reasonable and and be able to either include that amount or adjust it. So best to keep good records, but if you don't have that, come up with whatever you do have, and at least you're trying to create a better defense in case it gets audited. One of the uh, properties I just sold in Dana Point, uh, very similar to what we're talking about here, he was able to find the receipt or the payment from his credit cards, which allowed us to actually contact Home Depot, and, and I was amazed at how far back that they were able to generate the receipts. And we didn't do it for every um, expense, but there was uh, some significant remodeling that he did uh, so that it was a time period. And we were, you know, Home Depot was very agreeable and very uh, supportive in allowing us to, uh, to generate those type of information. One That's of the awesome. things that you just brought up is, uh, should I consider, I think you said a, a 1031 exchange, basically, mm -hmm. If I had this rented, this property rented for a couple of years, how does that affect the situation? Yeah. So first off, one of the requirements for being a for doing a uh, 1031 light kind of exchange is it cannot be personal use property. It needs to be considered used in a trader business, which could be a rental property. It could also be held for investment. It just can't be personal use. So make sure that it it does have that that it meets that requirement. So. Like you said, if it's been held for a couple of years as a rental property, that's that's an interesting time period too, because if it's only been rented out for two or three years and you if you lived in it for multiple years ahead of that time, then not only could you maybe use that 1031 exchange to defer a significant portion of the gain, but you might also be able to combine part of that with the principal residence, residence exclusion as well. But ignoring that, uh, some of the things to keep in mind when doing a section 1031 exchange is the timing of the exchange and then going bigger in size and in leverage. So for example, if you have a million dollar property with a half a million dollar loan, and if you're exchanging it for, let's say, uh, another million dollar property, but a smaller loan, let's say $300,000, even though it is a comparable size, you could have debt boot, or in other words, because the amount of debt has gone down on that property, there could be some recognition of gain. Uh, if the property is less in value, you could, be, you could recognize some gain. Um, you, there's also a lot of flexibility with Section 1031. You can sell one property and acquire multiple properties. You don't have to close on them at the same date. You have a period of time uh, to sell one, identify the next one within 45 days, and then to close on that property. You can also do it backwards. If you find the dream property uh, you want to purchase and you have the funds, you can purchase that one, do a reverse 1031, and then sell your property. 
the key thing though is that you need to be planning these well in advance you need to have an intermediary lined up who they can advise you on these things because the nuances the devil's in the nuances and you don't want to be caught at tax time with your cpa saying actually you didn't do that correctly now you owe the tax plus penalties and interest it's very interesting Everything that you're talking about right now, you and I have gone over at noise uh, with uh, each of our different clients, and it, it changes person by person, uh, depending on their circumstances. So I guess the net result uh, would be that early on in the, in the process of selling your home, that we should set up a consultation with an accountant like yourself uh, to go over these nuances which could have a substantial difference in tax implications, as well as overall generational wealth. Um, I believe that you also do a preliminary consultation, something along these lines would be probably an hour investment. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I'm more than happy to, to share an hour or two of my time, uh, complimentary, because I wanna be able to establish that relationship. And if I can answer someone's question that time, more than happy to share that goodwill. Uh, and if it, it's the right fit for us and the right fit for you, we're happy to take you on as a client. But that that little bit of time, just letting uh, your tax advisor know, hey, I'm thinking about selling my house. They'll have some follow-up questions. We want to know approximately what do you think you'll sell it for? What's the timing of it? What's the reason for it? Where are you going to move? What are you going to do afterwards? What's your overall extended family situation? Do you have kids that might want to buy this property? Have you done some financial planning? So be ready for some of those questions. And you might not have those answers, but as we send you forth to go get more answers and to start these this planning process, we want to have time. It's, it's really hard to do some of this. If you're coming to us, you've got an offer in hand, and we only have 30 days to give you some tax advice. It really limits the amount of options and planning we can do. Yeah, which goes in line with uh, what we're always pushing, which when you're selling your home, it really is a major project. Uh, with any major project, there's two there's two sections. One is design, second is execution. Uh, we drill down, it's discovery, design, plan, and execute. Uh, during that discovery stage, we would get all these questions answered. So we're making sure that we'll walk away with the most amount of money possible after you sell your house. It's not just how much money we actually sell your house for, but how much you're able to keep. And that's where an accountant like yourself comes into play. With that being said, let's switch over now to where the, um, the younger generation is out looking to buy their first home. And, you know, back to rich, rich dad, poor dad, um, you know, that finan that financial acumen is so important uh, for the younger generations. What are what are the first two or three things that come to mind when somebody is looking to buy their first home? Yeah, that's a really good question. One of the first things that comes to mind uh, is do as much as you can to learn about and understand debt and leverage that's because I've, I've known people uh friends family who when they're saving up they'll say well is it a better investment to go buy tesla stock or to buy my first home so one thing you don't get when you're buying stock is you don't have that leverage so if you have a hundred thousand dollars let's, let's make it even simpler if you have ten thousand dollars uh and you're going to put it in the stock market stock market increases ten percent then you have a $1,000 uh, unrealized gain. If you put that 10,000 into a home as a down payment, let's say you qualified for a 10% down, so you have a $100,000 home, the $100,000 increases also 10%. How much did you gain? Well, $10,000, 10% of that $100,000 home is the home's appreciation, but your cash on cash gain, is 100%. You just gained $10,000 of real um, appreciation on a $10,000 investment. So that's the first thing, um, is understanding debt and leverage and just the magnitude of how important this first investment is. It's usually people's biggest and most important first investment they'll make in their lives. Um, and and the, second, the second concept I would emphasize is that Although a home is an amazing investment, it also needs to be a home. There can be reasons why 
you might want to buy a different home because it's a better investment property. But if it's not in the right neighborhood, if it's not close enough to where you'll be working, if it doesn't work with your lifestyle, this also needs to be a home that works for you. And you don't want to just be thinking, I'm living here just to get, you know, to make some money on it. Because depending on where the market is, if the market were to dip, uh, depending on what your timing and planning is, you might not be able to sell the house for what you want. And if you've taken on a lot of debt or leverage to buy that property, then you could be underwater on that. It's not an issue if you love the home and you're going to be there for a really long time. And the math always works out if you're looking in a longer term perspective, uh, because appreciation really is exponentially bigger in later years. Yeah, you bring up a very good point. Um, my motto always would, when I'm working with buyers is first pick the neighborhood. The structure itself is something that can be modified, upgraded, those type of things. But the neighborhood is something that takes a lot longer to change. And usually the only way you change it is by leaving it. So versus a structure. So I'm glad that that fits uh, in line with our strategy that we're pushing here at MF3P. Yeah. Uh, can uh, some of the uh, affordability comes into play when we're talking about the first time home buyers and the difference between paying rent and the difference between owning? For example, if we have a $5,000 a month rent versus a $5,000 a month mortgage, what's the what's the net true cost to that buyer using that rough number? As you're as you're saying numbers, my the accountant in me uh, <laughs> is opening up a spreadsheet, and now I'm creating two different columns: five thousand for rent, five thousand for mortgage. I think that kind of exercise of uh, get out a spreadsheet and start doing some math is really helpful because then, as you start to have those numbers and you share that with your tax advisor, we'll be able to say, "Hey, this is great." ground level work, but let's think about this on a grander scale. So when we, my, when my wife and I uh, lived in California, we were happy to rent because we found a place that was a third the cost of owning that same home. But we knew this was only going to be a short-term solution. I'm from the Pacific Northwest, and when we were expecting uh, our family to grow, we wanted to be closer to our, our parents to get help with the grandparents. So mm -hmm. we moved back to the Washington, and we knew we were going to be here for a really long time. So even though renting was going to be cheaper, we still stretched our budget, made it work, uh, and were able to find our first condo. Uh, three years later, we were very fortunate to have the ability to uh, upgrade and, and buy a bigger uh, single family home with a yard. And that's where we still are today. We love it. But I tell you that story because I it really drove home for me how... When people say, well, how much did your condo cost? I would say, well, it was free. What do you mean it was free? Well, because of the appreciation during those three years we were there, when we sold it, the equity that we'd built covered the fees from selling. It covered all the mortgage interest we'd ever paid. It repaid basically the, the mortgage that we put into it. We had that, those principal as part of our equity too. It was a condo, so we had an HOA. The appreciation covered the HOA. So in a sense, for those three years, I was putting money into the pot. But at the end of that period, when we moved, I got all that money back plus some and was able to roll that into uh, the home that we are in today. Now, if we were paying rent, that would have been a much different financial answer. So yeah, if you're strapped for cash and need to live month to month, paycheck to paycheck, sometimes you don't have that option. But in the long term, you almost always get ahead by looking at, is this going to appreciate? And I know it doesn't always work and life sometimes throws you curveballs and the market can dip. But Overall, most of our clients have also made most of their wealth through real estate. So I, there's just an overwhelming of amount of statistical and anecdotal evidence to support um, if the long run, you're going to be better with a mortgage. Not to get into too much of the minutiae, but when we're talking about the mortgage interest deduction, can you explain a little bit about that? Yeah, that's a great question. So for a new home buyer who maybe has never owned a who's never owned a home before, maybe you've never had to itemize on Schedule A, uh, especially with the uh, income tax deduction being limited to $10,000. The standard deduction might have been a better answer for you. 
Now, when you buy a home, the interest that you're paying on the mortgage, which keep in mind in those early years is most of the mortgage payments you're making, is going to be eligible as a deduction on Schedule A of your tax return, an itemized deduction, along with the property taxes that gets capped out the $10,000 limitation right now. And keep in mind also that limitation, which came into place because of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act back in 2017, is scheduled to expire at the end of 2025. So unless Congress changes something, uh, we might see some more deductibility, more tax benefits of home ownership in the future. But in the meantime, that mortgage interest limitation, that mortgage interest deduction reduces the amount of taxable income that you pay tax on each year. So another way to look at this from a financial planning perspective is if you have, let's say, a 5% interest rate, but you are just for simple math in a 20% tax bracket, by being able to deduct that mortgage interest, take 20% of off of that 5% and you're left with 4%. So whatever the mortgage interest rate is, you're after tax mortgage interest rate is lower. So that's something to also consider. Yeah, I guess uh, the last uh, property I just sold in Tustin, um, they were able to adjust their deductions enough to spend an extra $1,500 a month mm. on their monthly payment. And it was still a net, uh, it was the net same investment to them that they were paying for rent which uh, really did. So I think it took it from 5,000 a month to $6,500 that they were actually able to spend on their monthly uh, mortgage payment. That's and, a great way to look at that. <laughs> yeah. And Thomas, one of the big things with uh, the baby boomers, especially, uh, they have a tremendous amount of equity in their homes. And a lot of them are considering reverse mortgages. What are the pros and cons from your standpoint? That's a really good question, especially with how much real estate prices have increased. And when you're retired on, on fixed income, some of those things, increasing costs, are, just become almost infeasible or impossible to do. Uh, not to mention property taxes. That's something that really can be scary is seeing your property taxes go up before you're at the age where you can lock them in. And what... What that can mean is if you don't deal with those situations, you could get into a situation where you have a tax lien on your house because the property taxes weren't paid and you could lose your house. So there could be very dire situations that could warrant getting some kind of cash flow. And a reverse mortgage is a perfect example of how you can be able to pull some of that equity out and have some cash to pay for expenses and kind of create some supplemental income for your retirement. Now, some of the words of caution I would share uh, related to uh, reverse mortgages. The two things I would say is watch out for the equity limitation that you might have and the timing of the sale. Um, so what I mean by that is the reverse mortgage is, of course, using your equity that you have in the home. And some of the reverse mortgages that are out there, and I'm definitely not a reverse mortgage expert, but the loan to value that you might be eligible for could be 50, 70 or more uh, percent of your the value of your home. Now, if you've owned the home for a really, really long time and your basis or what you can deduct against the sale of your home is really small, that you could have a situation where most of your value would be considered a gain and subject to tax. So uh, let's say, for example, you bought the house for $100,000, you're selling it for a million, so you have a $900,000 gain. Well, depending on the rest of your tax situation, that gain could be taxable anywhere from 24 to 37% between federal and California. So if you don't have a 37, 24 to 37% of your gain available in that home equity, then there could be a situation where you try selling your house and you don't have enough cash after the sale to pay for the tax on your house. So making sure that you have enough equity left over aside from the reverse mortgage to pay a capital gains on an eventual sale of your home, that's that's one thing to definitely consider and talk about with your tax advisor before going too far with the reverse mortgage. Uh, the second thing is just related to timing. So your uh, if your kids are planning on maybe moving into that home or if that's going to be 
the main asset that they would inherit. Well, do they know that if there's not the ability or the equity for that home to pay the reverse mortgage, that they'll probably lose the home from the family? Also, there could be other situations like when you decide or need to move, maybe you're you need to move for health reasons and move closer to uh, the kids. Uh, they might be living someplace more affordable if you try to sell the home or so you try to move out of the home. But now when you move out of the home. That could be a, uh, an event for calling the mortgage. And now there's not enough equity left in the house to even sell it and to pay the reverse mortgage. So you could get in a situation where you're stuck. So in summary, I think they could be a really useful uh, planning tool. Uh, definitely work with your financial planner and tax advisor, but it's not 100% for everyone. So make sure that you're also watching out what opportunities are you closing by getting into a reverse mortgage. Well, thank you very much, Thomas. The last question, you had brought up that there's uh, there might be something expiring. Can you elaborate on that? The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Yeah, so the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act uh, back in the end of 2017 had a lot of different kinds of provisions in it. To simplify the tax provisions, you could put them in an individual bucket, and then you also have the business bucket. So for the individual tax provisions, one of those was the interest, the the limitation on deducting income taxes, property taxes on Schedule A. There were some other things like being able to deduct miscellaneous expenses, um, like a home office over 2% of your AGI. One of those other limitations that would be expiring that was actually for our benefit is the lifetime estate exemption. And the reason I mentioned that is because for homeowners who have been owning their home for decades and are wondering, well, do I live in here until my kids inherit the property and they'll get a step up in basis? Or do I gift it to them sooner? Well, keep in mind that depending on your estate situation, when that changes, instead of having a 11 to $12 million estate exemption, that is going to be cut in almost half. So there's going to be a huge tax opportunity that will be missed after 2025 if you don't plan for that. So depending on your situation, gifting some property or doing a partial gift and sale of a property, there's a lot of planning opportunities that are going to come up in the next year and a half. Well, that's great. Well, I want to thank you very much for your time. If there's anything else that you'd like to ask Thomas, uh, we'll leave the information below. Uh, if you like what you heard today, please uh, subscribe and follow uh, on YouTube. Uh, thank you very much for your time today, Thomas. And we'll make sure that we include his contact information in the links below. Thanks, Michael.